by way, considered a psychopath? But, oh, no, go ahead. You were going to say, please. By the way, similarly, uh, many, many narcissists and psychopaths do not lie. They're brutally honest. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Wait, no. See, because why, gotta... why would I need to lie for you? I mean, to lie is to invest an effort. Do you deserve this effort? Do they brag? You don't about, deserve this wait, effort. Do they brag about the fact that they don't lie? Yeah, I do. Because I, I never lie. Why do I have to lie? I'll just, I like, never lie because no one deserves the effort I, that I have to put into lying. You know. Got it. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because you got to put. Some I mean, effort. I'm God. I'm God. Why would yeah. I need to lie for yeah. for the sake of ants? I mean, you're you're all ants. You're yeah. a colony. Why would I need to? So I never lie. So these online myths that narcissists always lie that they always act, it's expressly untrue. <laughs> some narcissists act, some narcissists lie, and I don't think it's much different in the general population. So, but if there is any tendency, it's the tendency to not act, to not lie, because to act and to lie is to kowtow to you, is to succumb to you, is to, is to kneel in front of you, is to render you superior. You don't deserve my lying. You don't deserve my acting. You don't deserve the time and effort it takes to act and lie would there because be, you're inferior. Would to there me. be any moment that they feel that they may need to, if someone else they may perceive has more godlike authority or power than them? Do they then? This could happen with narcissists. Narcissists yeah. have role models, okay, that they idolize and idealize. Got it. But never with psychopaths and never with uh, psychopathic narcissists. All right. When it when it comes to a psychopath. Just do me a huge favor, because I know somebody's going to ask me this. Your definition of a psychopath is what? First of all, it may come as a shock to many people. Mm -hmm. uh, psychopath is not an accepted diagnosis. Ah, really? It's not a clinical. It's clinically rejected. It's not accepted. It is espoused by a group of scholars, which are outliers and outcasts even like Robert Hare and others, Babia. These scholars claim that there is a very extreme form of antisocial personality disorder Yeah, that is so extreme that it needs to be differentiated. It needs to be separated. And they call this extreme form psychopath. Got it. But, but you won't find the psychopath, for example, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's not there. The word doesn't exist. So... Psychopath is simply someone who is extremely antisocial in the sense that he disrespects social mores, rules and conventions. He's defiant. He's impulsive. He abhors and rejects authority. He is impulsive. He is reckless. Above all, he is reckless. He doesn't care. Dare, de de daredevil. He's, he just goes. That's, he, he acts on a whim. That's you know? one of the identifying major identifying factors that they're reckless. Uh, yes. A psychopath. Okay, but it's yeah. not it's not uh, a clinical term. You're saying no. Sociopath and psychopath are not clinical. Terms. It's thrown around. It's like they can no. make you can make a series of movies by just making sure you throw that word in there. Yeah, the villain. As long as you can say the villain is that, everybody's going to fall in love with the villain, and I want to see him be crazy again. And, sure, yeah. and so it becomes a comedy. It's almost thrown around, like you said earlier at the beginning, uh, narcissism. Is thrown yes. around. There are two types, two types of psychopaths according to the proponents of psychopathy. The proponents of psychopathy are, are an outside group. They are not in the establishment. So according to them, there are two types of psychopaths, primary psychopath and secondary psychopath. Secondary psychopath is a primary psychopath who has emotions and empathy. Okay. That's all. That's it. Primary psychopath is a secondary psychopath without emotions and empathy. So because borderline has emotions and empathy, when she becomes a psychopath, she becomes a secondary psychopath. When the narcissist becomes a psychopath, he becomes a primary psychopath because he has no emotions, has no, no empathy. Emotion. No emotion. Now, no access to me. All right. No access to me. Okay. Now, I have... Listen, I'm telling you, Professor, Sam, I do my research and I have... I get into it because... But you, man... I could, uh, I'm glad you're not a woman because I might want to take you out because, uh, All you, right. I want to, I want to bear that. I'll bear that in mind. For the next so, don't you, don't even start with me. So, so <laughs> I want to pick your brain. So here we go. This is all, everything is from your Instagram page. Uh, and of course your videos. No, I, I've please kinda, go ahead. No, no, I got a smash up of stuff. So I just want to get uh, a deeper understanding 
Victimhood. Victimized versus being a victim. Shed some light on that for those who maybe have an inclination to lean toward uh, victimhood. What do you what do you what do you mean by saying you've been victimized and yeah. you're not you're not you're not a victim per se? Let's start with a few facts. Okay. There are recent recent studies that had uncovered the fact that some people have a tendency to feel to feel like victims, even when they're not. Oh, there is wow. a new there's a new construct called TIV, yeah. interpersonal victimhood. Okay. TIV, it was discovered by Gabay, G-A-B-A-Y, and others. Okay. There are other studies. And so it would seem there's Cartman with the drama triangle, um, and so on and so forth. And so today we, we tend to think that some people are more prone to believe themselves to be victims, more prone. They have a tendency, a proclivity. And, um, and so this is fact number one. Fact number two, when victims organize, and when they create victimhood movements, victimhood-oriented movements, these movements tend to be hijacked by narcissists and psychopaths. Okay, this time, is, whoa, 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 time out. That's mind-blowing what you just said. Yeah, this is also established they in a series of recent studies. And yeah. can essentially get hijacked by yeah. a narcissist. That movement. Right, okay, and psychopath. Okay. The third, the third fact, these are facts. These yes. are all established by recent, recent studies, 2020, 2021. Okay. The third fact is that victims of trauma, people who have been exposed to trauma, in, when they enter the post-traumatic condition, they tend to display pronounced narcissistic and psychopathic behaviors. Whoa. In other words, they become temporary psychopaths and narcissists. Consequently, there is a, a very dominant movement in psychology today, headed, spearheaded by Judith Herman, the woman who coined the phrase complex trauma or complex PTSD. Mm -hmm. Judith Herman suggests to eliminate the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder because she claims that it is a form of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And she says, and many others say, and I say, and many scholars say, that it's impossible to distinguish the victim of a trauma from an active, borderline, grandiose, narcissistic, psychopathic state. Whoa. So these are the three facts we can start with. Now, as to your question, what's the difference between being victimized and being a victim? Yeah. Everyone is victimized in a lifetime. I've been mugged. I've been mugged twice, actually. <laughs> My mother had abused me horribly as a child. I mean, everyone is victimized. There's no, you can't go through life unscarred. Life is the agglomeration and conglomeration of losses, you know. Okay. You break up, you divorce, you're victimized. You know? So to be victimized is, is simply a synonym to being alive. To become a victim means to adopt what uh, the state of victimhood as your defining attribute, as the part of your identity. To convert what had happened to you into your identity. Got it. Not to say, for example, I'm a woman who had been victimized, but to say, I'm a victim. It's like I would ask you, who are you? So you could say, I'm a man. I'm a, I'm a, I have a podcast. I'm a, right, right. I'm a victim. Right. It becomes part of the identity, a, a defining feature of who one is, one's essence. It becomes a driven part of the personality and the character of the person. Yeah. They're identifying, uh, they're, yeah. they're identifying uh, their existence. And not what yeah. happened to them, but they're identifying it, what, what has happened as their existence. Take a Holocaust victim. You can ask a Holocaust victim yeah, who are you. Yeah, that's so true. he would say, he would say, I'm an accountant, I'm yeah. a father, I get I'm a husband. Yeah. But some of them, yeah. some of them would say, I'm a Holocaust victim. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of thing is this? Holocaust was a horrible event. And of course, survivors are entitled to be wounded and traumatized and so on. But is this who you are? It's not who you are. It's what had happened to you. So when you answer I'm a Holocaust victim, you reduce yourself. You demean yourself. You perpetuate the abuse. Because if you identify yourself as a victim, as a constant perpetual victim, you carry your, abusers, your abuser with you in your mind. 
Because in order to be a victim all the time, you need to have your abuser in your mind all the time. Hmm. You're just perpetuating the abuse by remaining an eternal victim. This aspect that you're you're bringing to the fore, this is not something that a lot of people will find easy to swallow. Yes, uh, they call it bl- victim blaming, vict- victim shaming, victim I don't know what. But even this, I mean, look at these phrases, victim blaming, as though they are nothing but victims. When I sh- when I tell someone, you're not a victim, you ju- you've just been victimized, and you had contributions to your own victimhood, which you should study in order to avoid them in the future, to avoid the same pitfalls. So... That person doesn't say, you're shaming me as a woman, or you're shaming me as a, as a 40-year-old, or you're shaming, she says, you're shaming me as a victim. That means she's only a victim. Victim shaming means that I'm shaming someone who is only a victim, nothing else. And that, of course, is sick. It, it's pathological. You are never one thing. You're a panoply of things. You're a kaleidoscope, you're a spectrum of things. Your father... You're, you're a man, you're black, you're, I mean... No, many you're, you're looking at you're, you're many aspects that can make up yeah. who we are as a person. Yeah. And from your perspective, what you're highlighting uh, is that we don't have to pigeonhole ourselves by what someone else did to us, but yes. we can look beyond what they did and get them out of our head, and we can create new memories, new concepts, we can structure it and move on with our life even though it may be challenging and difficult, I know you're understanding that, but, but over, overall you're saying it's not a matter of victim blaming and shaming from what you're, you're laying out right now. There's a bigger picture involved in which a person may not see themselves as a victim, but because of the way society often puts people in a position to only be a victim. Now, I'm just going to tell you this right now. I'm going to throw this in. Nobody's expecting me to say this, and I know you're not. But I'm just going to say this. I wasn't planning on saying it. That's a common concept and construct that you're talking about right now in many minority neighborhoods. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you because I grew up in one. And it's like, there, you know, some of the old guys sitting in the barbershop or you know, sitting on the street corner uh, watching kids go by and go like, no, you're not a victim now. Just because somebody treats you a certain way, you can, you can be whatever you want to. But when you flip that around, uh, it can... Uh, it can sound kind of funny to others that may hear it, but uh, there are a huge swat, uh, a huge group of individuals that can understand what you're saying. Uh, There's that, a simple maxim. Simple yeah. maxim. I hope that as made sense. That was that was my street ghetto explaining uh, what was in my head that just popped in my head. But go ahead. You were saying a simple maxim. As long as you're a victim, the abuse continues. Simple. As long as you remain a victim, your abuse is continued. Only you can stop the abuse by refusing to be a victim. Well, any mis- any mistreatment can either be minimized or eliminated by the way we handle and perceive what has transpired. The I- whole concept of resistance, including peaceful resistance, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, etc., the whole concept of resistance is about refusing to be a victim, refusing to be a victim. Well, well, well people fighting back. People that that have lived with you, individuals that you called earlier your insignificant, uh, whatever the case may be, others that have come in across your path, live with you, interacted with you over time. They could either live as they see themselves as a victim, or they could see themselves as com- a, a common ground between you and them. And live together. Um, if they continue to live with me, they're making a choice, aren't they? Yeah, I read some of the stuff you said about that. I, I find you fascinating because well, the minute the minute they've made a choice, they're no longer victims. Even if I victimize them, they're no longer victims because they've made a choice. It's important to understand. Uh, victim victims. I believe that the label victim should be applied much less liberally. I understand a child two years old victimized by his parents. That I understand. That's a victim. That's a real victim. 
a grown up woman who chooses to stay in a relationship with her abuser despite the abuse allow me to doubt her victimhood status that, that becomes that becomes an opportunity for us to do another show if i could so convince you to do that anyhow i just want to drop that in 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 front of you to to keep in mind because i i truly want to dissect that but i'm not going to throw away what's in front of me that i have to ask you about i'm going to say a word the word is boundaries give me your perspective on that word that is often mentioned in the community of those who talk about narcissism boundary a boundary is where i stop and you begin simple where i stop and you begin i can let you enter i can let you enter like crossing the border into a foreign country you need a visa you need to qualify you need a negative pcr test recently you need to be vaccinated then i may let you cross in but even then it will be for a limited period of time and you have to exit that was good that was really good you have to exit simple if you refuse to exit you're violating the law you can't set up you can't set up camp and just take over no, and take over the can't. territory now the boundary always has been, temporary always temporary always temporary got it you have to recognize my separateness the problem in narcissism is that there is a there is a process in childhood it's called separation individuation it's when the child learns to separate from mommy and explore the world now when the child separates from mommy and explores the world the child is grandiose because you you have to be seriously grandiose as a 2 year old to abandon mommy and go into the street you have to be seriously grandiose so it's intimately linked with narcissism uh-huh. separation and individuation is intimately linked with narcissism if the process get gets disrupted what remains is the narcissism but the separation individuation fails there's a failure so you don't know how to separate you remain a narcissist but you don't know how to separate so the minute you come across an intimate partner for example yeah you are still a narcissist but you want her to become part of you you want her to become an extension you don't know how to separate from her you can't regard her as a separate entity you take a snapshot of her you internalize the snapshot yeah. you interact with the snapshot she ceases to exist and if she reminds you that she does exist by being independent and autonomous it infuriates you you want to suppress her autonomy and independence you want her to vanish as a separate entity because you don't do separation very well you don't know how to do it what well, it threatens you don't know how to do it never learned you don't know how to do it you never learned that from your mother so you were grandiose but the grandiosity didn't have an outlet because you were not allowed to separate got it you were not allowed to separate from mommy so you don't know how to separate from your spouse okay so i got children so i got to ask a question so if if that's the case let's say it's me i don't know how to separate the, do i start to sense when there's a possibility i start to perceive oh here comes some separation or they're going to ask me to look at it a certain way do i go into a certain mode and try to cause havoc so that i don't have have to have that separation do i make pushback do i become any time any time your intimate partner for example or your business partner remind you that they are actually separate from you yeah they are autonomous they have their own needs they are independent they make decisions they have agency they have certification they don't look at, you they don't look at the things the same way i do they may look yeah, at things they right. disagree with you That's... they criticize you what they happens? give you advice what they happens? give you advice give you advice right right what happens you you react with panic got it you react with panic you you don't have the tools the basic tools to cope with such a situation you you must assimilate them you must digest them you must break their spirit i must have them agree with me and not come at me you must have them disappear as separate entities of course if wow. they are if they are not separate entities if you are part of you they can never disagree with you because they are part of yeah, you yeah of course not no cuz yeah part right. of me so no. What's the dis- what's the disagreement? What's the disagreement? Any time you show me any time you show me independence, yeah. I will break your spirit. Wow. Any any time you show a sign of autonomy, I will ruin your day. I will penalize you. I will provide you with negative reinforcements. I will torture you and bully you just to take away 
your separateness. So I don't want you to be separate because I don't know how to deal with separateness. Separate threatens me. Okay, so separateness opens the door for what then? I don't want separateness. I don't want this person, the ch- children, workmate, uh, business partner to have this separate mindset because once that happens, it says what about me? You can abandon me. Got it. Got it. You can abandon me simply. Yeah. You could find something better. You could see something better. We're not going to have commonality. Common ground is gone because the only gar- ground that I know is my ground. And you have to understand you need to be on my ground, not your ground. And we get along just fine is the, is the mindset that I would be having. Not even ground. You need to be in my head. You need oh, to be inside my head. Okay. I need to internalize you. Why are you blowing my you mind would. right now, Sam? That was okay. So you, you need, need to be to, inside my head. You need to be inside my head. Yeah. Does that mean I'm so pretty much the minute you're inside my head? Yeah. The minute you're inside yeah. my head? Yeah. You don't exist anymore. Bingo. The yeah. real you doesn't exist anymore because I continue to interact with the you inside my head, with the avatar. With, it's called introject, with the introject or internal object. Got it. So I, I take a, I take a snapshot of Paxton. Yeah. I internalize it. Yeah. And I begin to interact with the snapshot because it's a controllable object which will never abandon me. Right. Not the person, the Paxton in front of you per se. That the person Paxton in yeah, front of me had just the snapshot. Vanished. The snapshot is what you ah. function and deal with every time you see yes. quote unquote Paxton. And then and then Paxton, you the real you. Yeah. You disagree with me, or you oh, go right. to take a leak, or I don't know what. You, you right. show Whatever. signs of life. Right. <laughs> you show signs of life. Okay, that's and really that, good. You show sign, that, I show signs of life, and then you will do what? It threatens the snapshot. It threatens the snapshot, because the snapshot is static and fully under my control. And you're not. So you become an enemy. It's called persecutory object. Got you it. become a bad object, an enemy, yeah. because you're threatening the snapshot. By being independent and autonomous. I'm essentially ruining your life if I start to show independence. You're threatening me, seriously. Yes. You're threatening me because you threaten to <sighs> disassemble my entire internal world. Because you, you should understand this. If you destroy one snapshot, yeah. it's like a brick in a wall. The whole wall the, keeps the, the, come, the, whole fo- down. the whole photo gallery is shot. If I go to yeah. one, then the, then yeah. it's going to play out in other aspects and other photos yeah, because either, that you have. Either snapshots work or they don't work. If you prove to me that your snapshot is, is not working, yeah. all the other sn- snapshots will stop working. So Chain reaction. Chain reaction. Chain reaction. It's very, very serious threat. Very. Wow. And narcissists go to enormous lengths to eliminate you as a separate entity. Because you, you in other words, the snapshot doesn't work when it comes to Paxton then you got to get rid of me because the other yes. snapshots come under threat. Yes. And it's easier to get rid of you than all the snapshots in my head. There are two ways to get rid of me. One way is to devalue you and discard you. And the other way is to destroy you. Wow. If I, if I render you a mummy, Egyptian mummy, you know, it's okay. If I kill you and mummify you, it's okay. You will never threaten the snapshot. There's a famous movie by Hitchcock. Psycho, yes, 1960. Psycho, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, right. His mother, he mummified his mother. Got it. And every morning he puts her next to the window yeah. and puts her to bed in the evening and kisses her forehead right. and so on. Yeah. This is a kind of mother who doesn't threaten his snapshot. So at first I will try to eliminate your separate existence. I'll try to break your spirit. Simply put. Period, yeah. In other words, put me, put me, put me back in my corner as it were. It doesn't work. I devalue you and discard you because you're too much of a threat. If it escalates, then you have to go into a whole nother level to destroy. Depends how resilient you are, how much you push back. And whether you want to go through that or just discard me and move on to something else. Oh, I, I would put every narcissist would put a considerable effort before okay. before the devaluation before the discard. Got it. Before that. Okay. So um, there'll be there'll be huge huge fights and conflicts and so on. There'll be a lot of <laughs> uh, wait, wait, a lot of ruining people's days just uh, to, to get to that point of saying, okay, then you know what? Then I'll just discard you. If, if, you, if I can't put you back in, uh, into okay. snapshot corner. But I need you. I need you to conform to my snapshot. Got I need you to conform. 100%. Okay. There can be a, no divergence or deviation. Uh, you're doing it to me. I say, I mean, you have no idea. You know what? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be all right the rest of this Saturday out here. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be. I'm used, to, I'm used to doing this to people. Oh, so, yeah. Hey, hey, look yeah. at you smiling. You, yeah. Okay. So now, 
Uh, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a clock over here. Make sure. Uh, just bear with me. I'm going uh, to do this real quick. Um, no, 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 don't be under pressure. Go ahead. I'll okay. give you the cue. Okay, here we done. go. Um, I mean, people, people simply don't have patience to watch more than one hour. Yeah. Um, I hate to tell you this. All my shows are at least an hour, maybe a little bit more, but I agree with you. But uh, you're going to, you know, your audience. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Well. Okay, we so are, here we go. Okay. Here we go. We're fine. Uh, pr- prize to price approach versus the long-term commitment. I, I hope you can, this is, it's a posting that you have. I, I'm not going to uh, pull it up right now, but you talk about uh, some view life in a short-term way. Uh, a, the prize to a price, uh, and they're not willing to make a commitment. I hope that makes some sense to you. If it doesn't, we can kick. We, we won't kick the tires on it. Uh, does that make any sense? Uh, do you remember that posting? It, it's it's a rough. We, shot. as a society, we had removed the incentives for long term commitment. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Sex, sex is an incentive for long term commitment between two people. Mm-hmm. For example, the av- availability of regular sex is an incentive. Today you can have regular sex without any commitment. Um, Economic incentives are important in long-term commitment. Today, actually, you don't need anyone. Whether you're a woman or a man, you're totally independent economically, so there's no incentive there to team up with anyone. We have reached a situation, to cut a long story short, we have disincentivized intimacy and disincentivized long-term commitment. Wow. There is no reason to commit. There's only there's no price, only price. If I get married, if I if I get married, I risk half my property and half my income for the rest of my life. And what am I getting in return? I'm getting sex, which anyhow I can get using Tinder. I'm getting what am I getting? Honestly, what am I getting? Not much. I can have children with women without getting married, without even being committed. 40% of all children are raised in single, single mother families. I mean, we have created, and, and consequently today, the younger generations, wow. they have yeah. zero, they have zero intimacy skills, Commit- zero relationship Commit- skills. Yeah. Right. And they actually are terrified of intimacy and they, they distance them. They don't want relationships. Marriage rates have collapsed. Relationships have, mm-hmm. the rate of relationships has collapsed. Dating is down by 60% in the last 10 years wow. dating and the dominant the dominant sexual practice it's called sexual script the dominant sexual script is hookups um only only 18 only 19% only 19% that's 19% of people under the age of 25 ever had sex in an intimate relationship wow 81% of people under age 25 had sex or had only casual sex, never had any kind, any other kind of sex. No long-term commitment, no relationship, no... They don't know how to do no it. No structure. They don't know how to do it. Which is they an, don't have the skills. Which is an outworking of not having the skills to have an intimate... It's a use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. If you hook wow. up all your life, yeah. If you hook up all your life, you don't know to do sex in intimate relationships. I found if you that, have no intimacy. I found that posting in, in regards to this fascinating, what you're talking about right now. I just, I just wanted to throw that at you because uh, I wanted my audience to be able to, to hear that. They can always go to your, your Instagram page and watch your videos to get more on that. I'm going to run this by you. I'm going to throw this word at you, and you tell me what you think. 